Good morning and welcome to the Tales of the TT Live brought to you by the Spirit of Motorsport powered by Podium Vodka. And this morning and what would be every race day, so today sadly would have been a TT race day, but we can't bring you the races, but what we can bring you is the great Roy Moore. And we're going to have a little cup of tea, a little brew with him, and maybe reminisce a little bit on the previous TTs. He's going to share some little gems with us later on in the show, but we're just going to have a little catch up first of all. Roy, good morning to you. Good morning, everybody, wherever you may be. That's our mm -hmm. opening gambit from Ramsey Hairpin. Uh, would have been in 2020, whether you're listening around the world on iPhone, podcast, or whatever complicated system that you've got well uh, welcome from the isle of man not a very good isle of man i'm, I'm afraid to say as well and uh, thoughts of last year when i think we went down to ramsey airpin on probably every day of uh, of tt race week and came back disappointed on three or four occasions and then uh, like 2019 i think it finished up that uh, in the history books, uh, you'll find that I think there was something like five races in the one day. The clerk of the course, Gary Thompson, had a lot of decisions to make about getting racing ahead at all. It's not like the old days. We'll reminisce about a few stories and show you a photograph on the board going back to 1959, if we remember. But uh, certainly racing does not take part now under any conditions and uh, certainly one thing that you, you do if you if you're a kind of historian of the tt we're not we've just got well i'm old so i've got a memory <laughs> and that's part and parcel of it isn't it uh, if you can't if you haven't lived it you can't talk about it really mm. so uh, you can think back to days when you wouldn't have put the dog out and mm. and they were setting them off on glen crutchy road to to go for 37 and three quarter miles and probably f uh, further laps as well majority of races these days are held over only four laps and you go mm. back to 1957 and it was eight and generally it was seven so we have probably been waiting here we had our little briefcase we'd have done all our research during the winter and little bits and pieces and a few we don't kind of uh, concentrate on what happened last year that's that to me is is not a thing. Everybody, probably, if they've been there, will will know it. What what the feel is, or they like to hear, is the the uh, the kind of stuff that happened a little bit uh, further back. And uh, as again, as I say, if you've if you've lived it, well, then you can talk about it. But I would suggest there would have been a Boeing Boeing up on the uh, the start line up there on Glen Crutchy Road and. Gary Townsend would come on with his attention paddock, attention paddock, mm -hmm. due to mist on the mountain and the helicopter not being able to fly. There will be a four hour delay to today's racing. We will gather again at uh, one o'clock to see what the situation is. So, uh, yeah, it might, it might not have been, despite all the good weather last week, it might not have been such a good start. Saturday mm -hmm. wasn't the best. And no, again, it wasn't, was it? Again, when you when you're talking about uh, weather conditions at the speeds that are being obtained now, you know, 135 miles an hour, unbelievable. Mm. Saturday was very windy, and the mm. clerk of the course has got to be very very uh, mindful of that because up on the mountain, you can be zooming along mm -hmm. there. The riders will tell you. I I have never had the experience of it but can be zooming along, then all of a sudden there'll be a gust of wind, take you three and two and three feet across the road and you've got no control over it. And the helicopter again in the same situation, windy, trying to land on a piece of grass to possibly pick up an injured rider. Uh, all these things are got, have got to be taken into consideration in this day and age. Yeah, Gary's got quite a job there, Roy, hasn't he, doing the being the clerk of the course yeah he certainly has and uh, yeah it's, it's it's an employment i mean he's he's that's his job and uh it's not it's not an easy job to keep everybody happy uh some will be uptight about it uh, i know certain riders relish wet conditions michael rutter michael dunlop don't see any reason to go slower because the roads are wet than, mm. uh, than that if it says uh, you, you go back to the time where uh, 
how could you say it, works power and rider power, had a race stopped, again, you'll be fully aware that you can go out in the car and go to Ramsey and start off from here and it's, it's absolutely throwing it down. You get to Ramsey and the sun's out. Many, many times they're, they're going around the course and saying, what's it like in Ramsey, Royster? Oh, the, yeah, good, the sun's out, like you see through the bride. And then the next thing you go back to the grandstand and they say there's a, a load of mist coming off the, off the sea and we can't race. And uh, on the west side of the, off the, the, the mountain course, on the run from Ballacrane to Ramsey, that is very, very vulnerable for, you know, different conditions altogether. And many, many times in the history of the event, uh, there's been situations where you're sunbathing in one part of it and got the umbrella <laughs> up in the other, and it's just not possible to race. Mm, little microclimate of the Isle of Man. It it's is. entertaining. The, the theory of the Isle of Man is the weather. You miss the worst, but you miss the best. Yeah. <laughs> Roy, we've already had some comments. Thanks, guys, for joining us this morning. Remember, it is an interactive experience, so feel free to fire your questions our way. Um, Good morning to Michael and David and Paul Carpenter says, missing this chap's voice. He should be personalised voice messages for charity. I love that idea, Roy. What do you think about that? It did, uh, it did come to light, uh, yeah, that there was a lady, Jill Pack, uh, who mm -hmm. was, had a, a, was with Manx Radio and did a terrific job up and around the TT grandstand when, mm -hmm. when the radio was allowed to go out into the paddock and interview the riders and have chat shows. Unfortunately, uh, the, the decision was made by others that that wasn't uh, acceptable. So it was uh, dropped. And I think that was a ridiculous mistake, really, because mm. the fans and the, 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 the friends of the riders and the riders' wives, they get all that uh, tension just the same as the rider. And it's nice for them to be recognised from mm -hmm. the very, very top who get more than enough publicity, to be fair, mm -hmm. the works, top works teams. And uh, certainly my kind of inkling is always the people in the lower part of the paddock. And if I'd have gone up into my spare room now and looked out, if it would have been a normal TT, it would have been saturated with tents and mm -hmm. activity. And the run to shop right around the corner would have been highlighted the be trolleys going up and down the street and uh, just the general atmosphere of it and if you don't report that people don't know about it mm -hmm. and that is uh, unfortunately a fact of life uh, powers mm -hmm. that be dictate what they want the powers that dictate them with financial input dictate what they want as well mm -hmm. and sometimes it goes uh, goes the wrong way and in, in my not professional opinion, but uh, enthusiastic opinion would be the correct way to describe it, I would think. Mm. I do think I, I wouldn't mind waking up to um, to your voice on my alarm clock in the morning. I think yeah, that would well, be a good look. I think you raise yeah. some money for some good charities there, Roy, definitely. Let's we get those recorded. Had, he did get uh, Gary Thompson on his attention paddock, attention <laughs> paddock with the beep yeah. beep. And the fun, the thing is, and uh, from Ramsey Hairpin, it's back to the grandstand. <laughs> and that, that is the kind of uh, outline every time. So people get familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And you have two voices as well. You know, I mean, it, it's all right if, you do, if you're a football pundit or something like that sitting in a studio. But when you're on site, the adrenaline rushes or whatever they call it is such that you, you do get excited. Some people like that. Others think, what the hell is he on about? It's not that exciting. But sometimes, and most of the time, it is. So you do tend to have two types of voices. And you can be doing the introduction in a nice, calm, allegedly controlled way like we are, having done your research and having, yeah, yeah, notes in front of you. Nobody, nobody does anything without notes in front of you because you just can't remember. And as you get older it's even worse but mm -hmm. at the same time when the bikes are coming towards you and you've had all those years of watching them 65 whoa, must be more than that 68 70 years maybe of watching bikes coming towards you and you were excited then and you're excited now you can't explain why and mm -hmm. you just it just takes over and you might be screaming and shouting like a lunatic mm -hmm. but it all adds to the atmosphere and mm. when you sat there, I'm the eyes of people who aren't 
and you've got to convey that over. They might hear them go through Glen Helen. They'll get the times from Sulby. They'll get the times from Balaf Bridge. They'll have an indication on their iPhones as to who's winning, well ahead of I will uh, at Ramsey Hairpin. But as soon as that Eunice in the control tower says, and now we go, or Tim Glover says, and now we go to Ramsey Hairpin, we've already heard the bikes coming down Lazare Road, the sound of the bikes changing down through one, down one for Schoolhouse Corner, and down two or three, and you can picture them all the way coming out from the right-hander at the Parliament Square, which is packed with spectators. And they've got all the round-the-course uh, speakers, the loudspeakers on as well. So not only are they listening on their iPhones, getting the position of the race, they're seeing the bikes in front of them. And then within a few seconds, they'll hear some lunatic at Ramsey Airpin screaming and shouting as they go through and giving them probably information that they already know, but hopefully creating the atmosphere of somebody who knows the corner and can just see me looking at what they're imagining. Mm. And, uh, yeah, sometimes it, it works and other times it doesn't. <laughs> but, yeah, we've, uh, yeah it's, 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 we've done all right, I think, over the years. And, yeah, I enjoyed yesterday. It was really good. Yeah, it was so much fun, <laughs> was it? <laughs> you it go must... so far back with those boys, so it must be even more yeah, special yeah. for you to be to still be connecting with them like that and joining them on something yeah, completely well, two, different two hours just went in no time at all mm, it did didn't it so, so if you if you missed it yesterday guys it is the purple helmets um they put on a show or two for us which was highly entertaining we absolutely loved it but it's what better way to honor mad sunday if we can't be there and we can't be a part of the event then we had to try and bring something to the comfort of your own homes. And um, Roy goes way back until that was the first event that you commentated on there, on, wasn't it, Roy? How old 90, 20, yeah. 95. 95, yeah, Dan. Uh, and the boys um, put maybe three shows on yesterday. So it's over a two hour period. So if you missed it, I highly recommend if you want a good giggle, you don't mind a, a naked butt or two uh, <laughs> and a lot of Manx banter. Go and check it out. It's on our page. It's still available for you to view. Um, Michael Gernhill says, um, making me feel like he wants to be on this Southern 100, listening to uh, the start line, listening to Roy's voice. Yes. Yes, Roy. Yeah, well, that's, a, that's another one which is entirely different, really, isn't it? We're talking mm -hmm. TT. We do have other meetings on the Isle of Man, the mm -hmm. Manx Grand Prix, classic. And then in 1955, it was a, a very simple procedure, really, because... Uh, the Isle of Man had terrific success in that year's Manx Grand Prix in 1954. A local rider called Derek Ennett won one of the, I think it was the senior race. And George Castain won the, another local resident from Castletown, won the 350 class, the junior and the senior Manx Grand Prix. And in those days, because you'd won the, the Manx Grand Prix, you were then classed as a rising star. Certainly, Derek Ennett was in that. George was a bit a bit older than Derek, but Derek uh, Derek Ennett came along, and uh, certainly he got works contracts from his success in the Manx Grand Prix, and that was generally the case. It was at a training ground. Jeff Duke came through mm. the Manx Grand Prix. You know, Bob McIntyre came through the Manx Grand Prix in the early days, plus others, Artie Bell, and you know a few that came through. But it's like it is today uh, to, to qualify to ride on the TT Mountain course. You need a, a license, and you still did then. You needed a national license. And the only way you could get a national license was to compete in virtually club events and then build your, your, your experience up so that you could then apply for a national license, which enabled you to ride in the Manx Grand Prix. And there's some lovely stories about how it was done on the island and how certain riders uh, kind of, you know, because you've got to be realistic. They didn't have many race meetings over here and you had to go away. And that strip of water costs a lot of money, even in those days, relative to what it is now. And they had to go to uh, Aintree and they had to go to various courses and circuits off island to actually get their license. So the, the Southern Club at the time said, well, why don't we hold a meeting? We've had terrific success 
there was a, a big uh, celebration in, in Castletown Square. Derek Ennett and George Castain were, were, and there was another rider called Sid Mizzen, who'd done well as well in, in both races. And uh, they honoured them. And then they said, well, we've just had this new bypass built because would you believe prior to the bypass being built, the buses had to go through Castletown as we know it. And it was narrow streets and everything. So they said, well, let's build a bypass. So they had this wonderful straight piece of road. So they all got together and said, well, what do we have to do to organize it? So they got a few really good, you know, enthusiastic people. And in 1955, they had them. And in 2020, they've got them still. The enthusiasm of the Southern Motorcycle Club. So in 1955, they put on the Southern 100, real road racing, a little Balloon circuit that they devised where you went down to the bypass and down through and then turned right at Balakagan instead of going straight on to Port Aaron. You then went down to a little section called the Iron Gate. The steam railway train went under Ballinorris Bridge. So that was a, a bit of a, a challenge, a little rise in the road over Ballinorris. And then through Ballinorris Farm, which is a twisty little bit. Joey's Gate wasn't there. That came later. But Ballinorris, Ballinorris Farm was, a, was a, a venue, would you believe? Those of you who've got good memories or remember a, a Rhodesian rider called Gary Hocking. He was Welsh, but uh, he wanted to ride the TT. Rhodesian rider, terrific rider. And he spent a winter in Ballinorris Farm with George Castain. Mm -hmm. Just getting the opportunity with a chap called Bob Doughty to go out onto the TT mountain course to learn it. And mm -hmm. he did because he came back as a TT winner and a world champion as well on the, the circuit. Joey's gate wasn't there then. That was that was put together by your man when he used it one practice to do a bit of plowing. Went through the gate, dug up a few spuds, turned around, came back out onto the course. Mm -hmm. And then you go into a little tight right-hander at Balabeg Hairpin. So you've got Balakagan, you've got Iron Gate, you've got Ballinorris Railway Bridge, you've got Ballinorris Farm, then you've got Joey's Gate as it is now, and then Balabeg, and then you went on to the back part of the circuit, which it's known, and it's always remained exactly the same. It's not been any different. There's no, been no road widening, but a resurfacing, but uh, drop down through, you went through Bala Whetstone, which was a right-hander, and then Charles uh, Williams, which is a left-handed corner. It wasn't known as Williams then, but certainly it was a little cottage on the right, Balloon Cottage, and that was the name of it then. Then past a farm run by a chap called Roy Gelling, down into a bomb hole, uh, which is a known, or the dip, Balloon Dip, out of Balloon Dip, and head down then past Maggie's Cottage into where we do the commentary from, Cross Four Ways. Entirely different. Talk mm -hmm. about getting excited. <laughs> you hear the boys off the line and you know that very, very shortly there will be 35 riders heading towards you and you've got to try and put them in some form of order. Mm. And it's a tight and acute right-hander. It isn't now. Unbelievable how they go around now with the grip. But we're stuck in a little garden uh, just by the side, right in direct line with them coming in. So... If you talk about excitement at Ramsey Hairpin, the first lap of a Southern 100 at Balloon is is uh, something else. Out, oh, yeah. of, uh, out of there and then through the beautiful right left of uh, Church Bends, Maloo Church, Parish Church, and then absolutely flat against the stop until you come into a place called Stadium. And it's called Stadium Corner because it's Castletown Football Club's ground on the right-hand side, the stadium that they play at. And then another acute right-hander, the final turn in onto the bypass again. Four and three, four and a quarter miles, I think it is, and they're averaging 114. So the Southern 100, coupled with the TT, coupled with the Manx Grand Prix. And there's been other things as well. I mean, the, on the island, again, for the simple reason, Jerby uh, Racing, Andrus Racing Cl Motorcycle Club, they started up. And they did various events down at Jerby and still do if they've been allowed this year to get the riders qualified. And people who have ridden at Jerby 
locals have gone on to be Milky Quail and Gary Beatty and oh, Nathan Harrison this year, double Manx, uh, last, yeah, last year, double Manx Grand Prix winner, started their motorcycling at Jerby initially. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's just, you've got to encourage, you know, I mean, it's mm. whatever sport you play, if you're on a confined island, A, you've got to have enthusiastic people to organize things. And then you've got to find what your ability is. And then when your ability is such that you're outdone your stay on the Isle of Man, then you go away. Mm. We, were talking, we were talking yesterday about Mark Cavendish. Mm. I remember Mark Cavendish. I went round to his house on an inquiry when I was working for a living. Mm. And he was just a little lad of about 10 years of age who was absolutely mad keen on, on cycling. Mm. And he got encouraged encouraged to, to, to partake at a higher level. And there you got now Mark Cavendish, world world known from the mm. Isle of Man. Incredible what he's achieved, isn't it, Roy? Incredible. It is, yeah. Still two wheels we're talking about, by yeah, the way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so if Derek Simpson's commented, could listen to him all day, so could I, Roy, definitely. Can I ask you a question? I'm going to fire a couple of my own at you, if you don't mind. Yeah, Roy. no problem. So the first one is, besides your... Yeah, cheers. Besides your spot, your infamous spot where you commentate from, where would you, where do you like to watch the, the race from? Where would be your favourite spot? Well, being absolutely blunt and honest, when I was young, which was a long time ago, but <laughs> say, say you went back, we've all, I think we might have not told the story about the, the family connection about my Jeff Cannell and being my cousin and mm. Uncle Jack being a former rider. So I was taken maybe against my will to watch bikes. <laughs> so when I became six, seven, eight years of age, I was a very nervous spectator. Seems strange, didn't it? I had all the, all the opportunity to go to, well, I didn't really, but when you think about it, that is not the statement to make. I didn't have uh, the transport to go anywhere else other than places that were relatively slow. My life had taken me to, uh, I didn't know it at the time, there was a lot of family turmoil going on. And with me being the young fella, I was farmed out when the big disputes were happening and you know all the things like that. You don't know that, do you? It's only when you reflect back and you say, well, why? Why was I spending time at uh, Auntie Flo's who live near Governor's Bridge? Mm. And now I know why. And then I said, well, why was I found out with Jeff Cannell up in Onken? And why did he drag me round to all the garages in Onken that were the works teams were staying? Mm. The Douglas Bay Hotel, the Majestic, you know, Douglas Bay Hotel with Jalira MV. And then up mm. to the, the the Majestic where uh, BMW was stopping and NSU and I think I'd be dragged around with Jeff, whether I wanted to or not. But I was walking. I didn't have a push bike. Mm. So when I was at Anti Flows, that was perfect because we would just go up to Governor's Bridge. And if anybody fell off at Governor's Bridge, well, they didn't hurt themselves. So that was one part of my life. And then it was centered then as to where you lived. So the mm. next big move, when we were like nomads for a while, the next big move is we were off down to uh, to, to, to um, Prospect Terrace. So that was a little bit away from the any of the, the corners. But my mother would always take us up back up to the, the wreck, as we knew it, mm. where we'd see the bikes start off, and then either it was the Clips course or the Mountain course, go turn right at Ballinard Road for the Clips, or go straight down Bray Hill. So you were seeing a bit of action, you know, later on as it, as you got built up. And then lo and behold, we, we uh, yeah, we were out from uh, Prospect Terrace and the next port of call then was Avondale Road in Onken by the Manx Arms, which you'll know quite well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Maybe not the outside, but you'll know the inside mm -hmm. quite well. <laughs> So I believe. I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard. And uh, they turned right at the Manx Arms and went up past our house in Avondale Road. And that was on the Clips Coast. So that would be 54 mm. to 59. So that was a period of my life, which was I could watch and I could move up to the nursery bends. I could go further up to signposts. I could go up Cacken's Lane to see them going up a big left-hander just where you turn into Birch Hill now, where Manx Radio first 
started in 64 with a caravan on the left-hand side. Mm-hmm. It was on the Clips course, so they've got that they're seeped in TT history. And then, uh, yeah, not venturing too much, but then from Onken, 58, 59, no, 59... 59 we moved from Onken, I think. So we moved when the when the Clips course stopped. But then the next port of call was in Spring Valley. Uh, we, we were fortunate enough to come all back together. My brothers had gone away to do national service. And then all of a sudden they came back and they were looking for work. And they, we were back as a family again then. And we were living in Spring Valley. So where better to watch in Spring Valley? The nearest point, Quarter Bridge. You know, that's uh, that's part and parcel. On mm-hmm. your push bike then, because you were posh, you had a push bike. <laughs> probably probably rescued it from the tip and <laughs> paint, hand-painted it. and then, But it had wheels, which got you further than you'd been before. Mm-hmm. A long saddle road to Braddon Bridge. Again, not, not a dramatic corner, but certainly then that you could see, you, you could get all the action you needed at Quarter Bridge. Down on your push bike for an early morning practice, Hop over the fence, down under Quarter Bridge. There's a big ledge on either side. And if you wanted to view them on the approach to Quarter Bridge, you went down on the ledge on the right-hand side. And if you wanted to view and go further out, maybe walk out towards Braddon, well, then you went down on the left. So we saw an awful lot of uh, action in and around there. And then, of course, the, the big thing that comes up is, you know, what are you going to do for a living? So again, we were living in Spring Valley right up till 1976. So again, we weren't connected with with going anywhere. Occasionally, you'd go to watch somewhere, you know, just kind of taken. You know, there there was a rerun on the other day about uh, 92, was it, with the Hislop Fogarty battle. And we Mm -hmm. had a big family family outing to uh, the bungalow of old places. Uh, I was a bit older then, but uh, that was, you know, entertaining. And of course, as soon as you got involved in '84 with commentary, you were dictated to where you watched the races from. Mm, yeah. You know, from '84 it was Ballacrane, and then we had a couple of spells up at the bungalow, and then, yeah, Ramsey Hairpin. So bit... it's, it's yeah, it's where you live has dictated mm. things in your life in many ways. Mm. And that, that certainly was the case in my life anyway. Yeah, because I grew up in Onken, so just by Governor's Bridge there would always be quite a yeah. common one we'd go to or or maybe sneak up by the Craig. So I spent yeah. so much time between those two because it was just so accessible. Or then you go up behind the grandstand, don't you? You can walk around up that way. Yeah, well, I wasn't living where I am now. I mean, I didn't come here till about 74. I think we, we started to live here in Victoria Avenue. Mm-hmm. Which is a better, you know, a better five iron to the to, to the action. Mm. So you just have to wander out the door and and you're right amongst it. But yeah, th- those were those were the regulars. And again, uh, the Onken trip was through Little Mill Road, mm. Little mm. Mill Road, where the famous, the world famous Purple Helmets performed for us last night. <laughs> yeah. Little, little Mill, past past Balakizik Farm, yeah, the home. Of the home of because Bala in Manx it means home of, so Bala Kizik is the home of Kizik, and Bala Hutchin is the home of Hutchin, and Bala Cran was the home of Cran. So lots of places on the TT course have got uh, Bala in front of them, and, and if nobody's aware of that fact. Mm. It gets a bit mistranslated when the Norse comes into it. You'd say, well, why why did somebody called Spur lived at Bala Spur, but it, it's a kind of a generation thing with the, the the name getting translated over the years so mm. yeah up the little mill road to hilbury but mm. then see a few through hilbury and you see it was too bloody sweat quick through here for me <laughs> and uh, yeah you might be thinking well i was always off the opinion in the background well what if somebody comes off i was not a good spectator mm. Mm. so corners braddon quarter bridge yeah we'd watched a few times at prey hill we watched in 67, there was a story of how we came about a pass, and I actually watched the Agostini Halewood battle in 67 from the bottom of Bray Hill. Wow. With, with a press pass that had been given to me by, would you believe, Ray Ennett, who was the brother of the Derek Ennett that we were talking about 
before and he said i'm fed up now he, he, he couldn't watch because his brother had lost his life in 57 on on a works ride for guzzy and if, if he'd have negotiated the guzzy with his ability he could have been a world champion but mm. tragically lost his life in 56 at the ulster grand prix on the works guzzy <coughs> and mm. uh, i don't think they recovered from it really you wouldn't would you Mm. Well, there's a bit of a family story about that when you're talking about how your memory jogs I mean his brother there was Derek Raymond and Norman Ennett from the famous Ennett family Derek Ennett lost his life in 56 uh, Ray was a very good golfer Ireland champion twice but the other brother uh, you remember a tragedy which unfolded in 58 shortly either before or after the Manchester United plane crashed when a, a team of uh, local garage owners and, and trade people went away to the Exide battery, battery company and the plane in mist and bad conditions crashed on Winter Hill. And I think there was something like 35 prominent Manx garage owners and yeah, wow. some very well-known families lost their lives. And Derek Ennett was on that, um, Norman Ennett was on that plane and he was one of the few that has, that uh, survived. Mm. So it's been a been a yeah a bit of thing about that. But uh, yeah, that's that's kind of jumping aside. Let's get back with the bikes. <laughs> yeah, it is. So I want to come back to the spectators, Roy. So for you over the years, I mean, there's some mental sections that we can go and get into bushes and we can watch the race and it's really exciting. But the, for a spectator from a spectator's point of view, how much has it improved over the years with regards to they're setting up grandstand every year. There seems to be a new grandstand around the track, doesn't there? There seems to be a new seating area. But I think part of the excitement is being able to climb through a farm and onto a bush and be hiding and, and soaking up the, the atmosphere from somewhere where you're not meant to be, right? Well, that's, this is it. But if 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 you, I, I just I hope you're getting the same kind of input that we're getting. Uh, there was a local rider called Barry Wood and myself, mm. and uh, he's good for a yarn, and he's got a deep Manx voice. Yes, oh my God, uh, <laughs> and Barry starts talking. You listen, but he mm. is so experienced about from a rider's point of view, and mm. from uh, you know an enthusiastic point of view. And we did what they call on the sofa. The very first one we did was at Douglas Golf Club. And uh, we just sat down. I had a mic. He had a mic. We started yapping. Somebody said, well, you better stop now because we were going to want to go for a pee. So we stopped mm. and then we talked again and it went down very well. And then we've done a couple at St. Ninian's Church. And in September last year, he said, well, we're telling all these stories, he said, but we could do with having them like permanently etched somewhere. I said, well, why don't we go on this Tinternet thing? He said, I'm not very good at it. And I said, well, I'm even worse. He said, but <laughs> Sean, Sean Hogg, he's, he's an expert. Well, I don't know about an expert, but he knows a lot more than we do. Ask him, will he set up a page? So we did it. So uh, I've had experience in the past of uh, Facebook and stuff like that, and it's not very complimentary to be fair, like, because somebody can come on at half past 12 at night and just quite categorically state, Roy Moore's a crap commentator and you've got no redress. So I, I didn't like to get involved. I thought, I don't want to get involved with anything like that. Oh, he said, that's easy. He said, we make it a closed group. So I said, well, what does that mean? He said, to get into it, you've got to be, you've got to ask to, to join. Then as soon as you show any kind of, uh, you know, thing towards anybody you'll be instantly deleted on that day because we've got the power as administrators to do mm. it so we fired it up and it's been an absolute gem as far mm. as i've concerned and even more so in the lockdown mm. i've become reasonably competent on putting a story together barry has but the stories that have come back from genuine genuine and i say that genuine who were riders, genuine who were spectators, genuine who were mechanics, who were all connected with the bikes. The stories that have come back, you could you could write two or three books on. Mm. And it's been a pleasure to be involved with it, and it's still going. Uh, the, the, the boys 
again another kind of fact of life is that if you've got a, a an enthusiast a real enthusiast photog photographer say who's taken a load of photographs he's probably not unless he sold them not shown them to too many people but he knows full well that if he showed a really good quality photograph on on the big time facebook that it would be instantly pinched and then used somewhere else or the stories would be pinched and used to for profit we had a couple of local lads who uh, you know i mean we do it for a pint of bushies mm -hmm. but at the same time the the response is, is just terrific and uh, it's all come about we we you know right up before we came on to do this which uh, is enjoyable because again a fact of life there's not many places you can go at this point in time to hear the likes of Jeff Cannell or Peter Neal speaking. They didn't do it when they were alive. And it's it's to our, our not benefit because we would love to, to tune in to them, you know, and listen to their stories. I listen to Jeff all mm. the time about stories and we'd swap a few. I didn't have many to contribute, but I listened and then you pass them on. You pass the stories on with a photograph. And some of the photographs you're trawling through there now, I mean, sadly, at this time of the year, and it, it's not to the detriment either, really, off the site, uh, there's a lot of uh, significant dates in and around TT Week and Grand Prix Week. <clears throat> and it gives the opportunity for people to remember the riders who are sadly no longer with us in a, in a I, I, how would you describe it? Uh, they're remembered. They're remembered every day of life but they're remembered in a nice way to other people who might have forgotten. And that is part and, <clears throat> part and parcel off the, uh, off the TT. And this is another way that we've done it. I mean, you've got uh, yeah, good, good photographs coming up there. When you're talking about spectators, <coughs> got a bit of a misfire on. I'll have, to have another <laughs> cup of tea. Let me just uh, just quickly share some of the comments we've had, Roy. And um, Martin Campbell says, great to get a TT hit from you. Always, uh, Adam Redding, always get something interesting out of listening to Roy, even if it's not racing related. Now I know what Bala means, including myself, Roy. I didn't know that. I didn't. That's, uh... that's great. Great little um, fact to learn. So what a, this site, Roy, um, yeah, you invited yeah. us in. It, it's it's incredible, and the history in it. You can feel. You, it's almost like when you describe it and you share it, it you can take yourself back into this time. It's in. What's that was, uh, what that, this is all about? Yeah, that, that was. Uh, I I think I read the story behind it. Mm -hmm. It was something to do with uh, practicing, uh, practicing TT riders with their knee out or something like that. Knee out touching the ground. And how do the riders <laughs> practice their knees touching the ground? And this fella came up with a, with a beautiful photograph of a start of a, of a, a whippet race, which would be in Yorkshire Lark, and they'd be all lined up. And uh, yeah, the, the one who can throw them furthest will get the win. And yeah, it was it was getting the getting the knee down. That's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was the whippets for handlebar resistance. Yeah, beautiful. They were they were working on the assumption that he was grasping the whippet's tail. And his head that was the handlebars and then if you notice everybody's got their left knee and this fella here would be a brian ball or a phil mccallum at the back and the other fella there would be more kind of sedate and it's just a lovely little aside <laughs> but when it comes up on the screen you just have a giggle and a laugh and over the last six or seven weeks when everybody's been housebound well then uh yeah it's, it's kind of helped me get through it i must admit just contributing and, and I'm sure so many others as well. Yeah, we've had page. some lovely, lovely comments about it. And mm. uh, yeah, it's just a thing. And then, of course, it, it comes that there's no racing. So we've done mm. stupid things. We've had the races, you know, that, like the one on the board on the back. And, uh, yeah, there's one going out, I think, on Friday. Now, there's a, there's a novelty. I mean, people come to the Isle of Man uh, to kind of watch the Manx Grand Prix. <laughs> And there is a story behind it. And, yeah, it's quite a thing. All those houses aren't there now. They've all been demolished. But when the Manx Grand Prix first started, way back in 1923, known as the Amateur Races, 
uh, they ran as the amateur races for a few years and then they became the Manx Grand Prix itself, the amateur races, Manx Grand Prix from amateur races to Manx Grand Prix. And again, when I was living in with my grandmother at the time, well, she was poorly and we had to go down. We weren't too far away from that photograph. Now, in the, the early days of the Manx Grand Prix, they were purely amateurs and they had kind of anything they could get a hold of to race. But they weren't the modern bike, obviously. They were the matchless G45, <laughs> G50s, AJS, Norton, hardly any two-stroke races. And uh, the Manx Grand Prix had a system whereby on the night before the race, and they only had two race days, they had the Tuesday and the Thursday, there was new, no newcomers. The classic hadn't been thought about. The Manx Grand Prix was purely junior and senior in the early days. The lightweight only came in in 64 or reinstated in 64. But they were all bikes of a certain uh, type which needed to be run to get the oil hot. So you could just imagine somebody pushing a bike up to the start, putting it on the line without the oil being hot. As soon as they got to a certain point on Bray Hill, the, the resistance would be such that it would just probably seize up. So they came up with the idea of weighing in the bikes. And what they did, they got a, a garage, a big garage in uh, Westmoreland Road. Are you familiar with that mm -hmm. area? Yeah, yeah. And it, was, it was known as Farragher's and Ashton's mm. in the early days. And they said, well, we'll clear our workshop out, bring all the bikes down here that you're going to race. We'll park them up over, overnight. And then to get the oil hot, what we'll do is you can then parade them at a controlled speed up to the grandstand. So the first ever kind of, uh, you know, in the early days, 35, 30, before the war anyway, that's what they did. They had the sum in the drill hole, but Farragher's and Ashton's was the, the focal point for most of them going in. So you had the excitement of seeing all the riders without their leathers on, pushing their bikes into Farragher's and Ashton to be scrutinized, checked over, and then the next morning, about an hour prior to the race, they would take them out. They would line them up on the road like they are there. And then they would bump start them and it was downhill. So you would go across Circular Road down towards Athol Street, but turn left into where the old newspaper offices were. Mm. And along by the Catholic Church, out of the Catholic Church, wake a few up in Timbald with the noise as you went then. <laughs> As you went then down Finch Road, down past to St. Thomas's Church, turned right and onto the promenade. Did the full length of the <laughs> promenade, went on one occasion, they went up into Onkin and up round the chip shop by Corkle's garage. But latterly, they went up Summer Hill, up Blackberry Lane, joined the TT Mountain Course at Governor's Bridge, and then got to the grandstand. By that time, the oil had got hot. It was all castor-based oil, real thick castor-based oil. By that time, the oil was sufficiently warm that they could then sit there for 10 minutes or so waiting for the start of the race, being more than confident that when they set off down Bray Hill, that everything was, was working smoothly and lubricated well. The trouble was that as it, as it went, I mean, I've been to parades in in 70s. I think it's, it was about 80, might have been the early 80s. When it changed to two strokes, when bikes developed water cooling, because remember the old bikes were all air cooled. When they did that and you pressed a button to start them, there was no need to do that then. So it was abandoned. And right at the very end, when the Yamahas and all that were going, they, they, they didn't want that because if they got <clears> too <throat> hot, well, then they were likely to seize. So at the other thing, they cut the promenade out and they went up uh, to Quarter Bridge, up Bray Hill, and then sit, sat in the pits. You don't have to do it now. The works teams mm -hmm. just press a button and the, the, the radiator's there and the thermostat takes over and they watch the temperature gauge go up to the desired point while they're sitting, not even on the move, and then they push them out. But the wow. way in the way in for the TT was not the same, but to get the oil hot for them in TT week, what they used to do, 
And if you watch the film No Limit, you'll see it actually happening. Uh, they didn't have the parade. They weighed the bikes in, put them in a tent overnight in the top part by the Mike Hailwood Centre, as it is now. And then on the morning of the race, they took them out. Somebody had put a line of dustbins, metal aluminium dustbins from the start finish right through to Governor's Bridge. And what the riders <laughs> did was to ride to Governor's Bridge on one side of the road, turn around at Governor's Bridge and then come back down. And they did that three or four times. And when you mention that the term round the bins, that's what it refers to. <laughs> the big MVs and Jaleeras and, and all the other stuff had to warm the engines up. So they had to do it that way, just the same way. But again, Fantastic. now not now not needed. In Park Fermi, they're up to race temperature when they, they leave that line. It's so a shame, it's really, park, isn't it? Because that's quite a spectacle, isn't it, for the... To see around the, in itself, the, yeah, yeah, it was good. Mm -hmm. Um, so tell us a bit about this. This is our final one for today. What, what, uh, yeah, what's the history behind this? That dreaded 33rd, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. It, it was basically showing the mist on the mountain, mm. and the 33rd, there is a story behind it, a bit of a sad story, really, but uh, I've no reason to doubt that it's correct. 33rd, the big two sweeping left handers which take her into Keppel Gate. And, uh, yeah, they get round there pretty handy. But in the mist, uh, it's pure rock face. So, you know, there's been a few kind of moments there as well. And uh, certainly the 33rd. The story goes that uh, a rider, I think it was in the Manx Grand Prix. Now, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but somebody will be able to tell us. Uh, he tragically, it was a misty. And, and in those days, the races went ahead, no matter what. Pouring rain. <clears throat> uh, down the mountain it didn't seem to bother them they didn't have any helicopters to think about and just mm. generally uh the the races went ahead and the poor lad lost his way at uh, coming over and, and lost his life unfortunately after finishing i think it was second or third in the previous this must have been the thursday on the tuesday he'd, he'd been on the podium and i think it was his family that uh paid for the widening of the 33rd there's been quite a few improvements over the mountain over the years, maybe not from the initial stages, but at the end of the mountain mile, uh, certainly coming into the veranda, that's uh, had a really good winter work scheme on it and was widened for road traffic mainly. And then coming into the Les Graham Memorial, that was all widened. The bungalow was naturally wide anyway when uh, Derry Kizik's father, would you believe, took the old bungalow down as a winter mm. work scheme. Derry will tell you the story about that. Mm. I digress, as I say we mm -hmm. do, but uh, his family put in the highest tender for the demolition of the bungalow, the, cor the corrugated roof and all the timber for £27. And they had to spend the winter of 58, 57, 58, up to in the demolition there. So that's mm. virtually unchanged. You go up Halewood Rise and through there, that's virtually the same. The Brandywell is the same. Dukes or the 32nd. Windy Corner has been widened now. It was always a tight right-hander. And then the 33rd has been widened. Mm. So going over the mountain, there's been certain places. But the 33rd was uh, is a legend kind of, uh, you know, the boys getting through there, that the speed they do now is incredible, really. And then having to get it through the little right kink and then the second right kink before they then line it up for... Keppel Gate, uh, yeah, Fantastic. but you would be going, you would be going ahead in the in the, in the rain then. Um, brilliant, Roy. I could just we we're, we're back Wednesday and Friday, aren't we? So <clears throat> excuse yeah, me, yeah. Listen to, it's catching. So we're going to be you. sharing more of your page, but someone has said they'd like to join it. So it's the Roy Moore and Barry Woods Mountain yeah, Memories Roy, Roy, page on Facebook. On Facebook, go into mm -hmm. there. We, we did very well on the uh, when we did the race night uh, for the um, Southern Hundred. We put it, we kept that private as a gesture to the Southern Club, really, for their support mm. and our support to them. And you had to join, and, and we had something like two hundred and fifty members just wanted to, to to get involved with it. Mm. So that was good. Yeah. Great. And one question with you, Roy, just before we close off. Does Roy prefer today's racing or racing from the older times? 
oh, up and yeah. said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I I know some some sports change, don't they? I mean, you'll see George Best at his best trying to dribble in what basically was a sea of mud. Mm. Now you see, the, now you see the lawn fairies, as Guy Martin calls them, dancing, <laughs> da- dancing round on perfect conditions. Mm. It wasn't as good, possibly, in the surrounding of the old days, but certainly to be allowed to be involved was the thing. You can't go anywhere now. Somebody mm. will stick their hand up. Can't go there, sir. Have you got a pass? You mm. do. Look at that photograph that you were going trawling through of bedstead and signpost. And that was all created by spectators getting off day trips, mm. walking up to signpost and bedstead and just absolutely packing the hedges uh, mm. and, you know, getting the enjoyment of a, a day's racing. So maybe maybe it's not the right attitude to have. You should move mm-hmm. with the times, but uh, mm-hmm. I, I won't, I don't think. And mm-hmm. I enjoy it. It frightens the life out of me, the speeds they're going at, and if, if something happened. Mm-hmm. But in the old days, it was just that, uh, yeah, I think it was the personal input of being able to see your heroes in every respect. You could go around mm-hmm. to their garage and see them <clears> in, <throat> in a shirt and tie or well, shirt and... And then you you just admired them as they went out uh, living the dream, as they say. Mm. Well, talking about moving with the times, Dom Herbertson, we would have seen quite a bit of him this week, wouldn't we, in, um, around yeah, the, yeah, our yeah, infamous yeah. track. He's joining yeah. us this evening at 6 o'clock. What are your thoughts on uh, what he could possibly have uh, shown us this week? I think he was on the on the up on it. He was uh, mm. he was one that would came in with with the with the Jamie Coward type of thing. That they you felt as though that the potential was there, and then like mm. Jamie Coward, and then he got his win, didn't he? Dominic got his win in the Classic, and he'd had his wins down at the Southern Hundred as well at the Pre TT Classic. So his father, family as well. Uh, I did listen to the interview with Chris Kinley the other mm-hmm. morning, and he is a character. He'll enjoy, he'll enjoy his company. He'll be. Uh, I can't do Geordie accent, but <laughs> I, can do a, I can do a Manx accent. And uh, that, but he, his his kind of enthusiasm is just bound him along. And yeah, he could be uh, yeah rising star of the future. Well, he already is. Mm. Uh, he's gone through the ranks. When you listen to his story about. You know, starting off on you know next to nothing and having to save up to buy a decent bike and everything. He, he's come up through the ranks to be a a, a star, whereas mm. others maybe have not done it as uh, in the same way. It'll be good. Mm. Great, great, brilliant, Roy. Thank you so much for joining us. We've got this again on Wednesday morning and Friday morning at the same time. Yeah. TT with Roy at nine thirty yeah. a.m. And uh, we'll be dipping back into that Facebook page, will we, Roy? Well, we can do if you want, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would love to. Okay, to me, yeah. Absolutely yeah. love to. Look. Thank you, Roy. Really, really hey, love few, this last few, hour. Two stones in the background for you as we <laughs> disappear here now. And that Ramsey hairpin, we're finished now here. <laughs> the next machine comes into view. Down through the box, takes it out, knee out, round tight to the inside. That sounds as though it's Ernst Stegner on the MZ going away here now from Victoria Avenue. As we return you to Haley at the grandstand. Perfect. Thank you, Roy Moore. Guys, if you loved it, if you know somebody that would love it even more, please share. This will be after our live. It's going to be available to watch whenever you want to come back to it. Share it with your friends. Comment. Fire any questions our way. We will be joining Roy once again, 9.30 a.m. on Wednesday morning and Friday morning. So if you send us your questions, we can have them prepped and ready for the great man that is Roy Moore. Okay, guys, have a wonderful day. I look forward to you joining us at 6 o'clock this evening with the great Dom Herbertson and also his pal from his infamous podcast, Chrissy Rouse, will be jumping on with us as well. Have a great Monday. We'll see you at 6. Thanks for riding with us.